Okay, well the instruments of peace was developed because people oftentimes, you know, is there some kind of a concise tool that can help me when I'm starting to feel some kind of upset? And I, I make a prayer, but it feels like I got a mishmash of ego thoughts just swirling around in my mind like a dark cloud, and I need to have some steps to be guided through. Uh, realizing that, of course, the more you do the steps, the more you kind of are like, almost like rewiring your mind and, and reconnecting, that it should get easier and easier to just zip back into your right mind as you open to this new way of thinking, and a new way of perceiving. But this instrument for peace is a way of, um, of working through things. Uh, also, I've, I've said, shared some very, very radical ideas during this uh, week. I had a group of students that were very devoted to awakening and everything and years ago, back in the 1990s, and so there was another version that broke out of the instrument for peace. This one says at the top, working through upsets and healing your mind. Um, the second version of Instrument for Peace was called uh, Healing the Pleasure, Working Through Pleasures and Healing Your Mind, uh, Releasing Pleasures. And, I, and the students said, oh, this is great. I said, yeah, if you ever want to do a workshop that's poorly attended, uh, just <laughs> yeah, do, exactly. one, do one on the second one. And they said, ah. <laughs> so I, it was quite serious. And I said, if you really want to go fast, you need to work with the other one too. But this is a little more introductory <laughs> and practical. People, well, yes, working through upsets and healing my mind. That's that's what I want to do. Uh, because eventually you start to realize that the pains and the pleasures are just two sides of one coin, and they both are capable of distracting you from that peace of non-judgment, of just being still. So it's a, the course is very different from that old thing about you know, accentuate the positive and affirm the positive and eliminate the negative. This, it's more the positive and the negative are both two sides of one continuum of judgment, and you have to really release the whole continuum. But this is is really a good start at uh, working with some of these metaphysics in a very practical way. So you can work with anything that's disturbing you. It doesn't matter if it's mild irritation or annoyance or if you have rage coming up or vengeance or something that's an intense emotion. Uh, it might be good if you start to work with this on a daily basis or whatever, it might be good to start with some of the smaller upsets and build some confidence with it before you go after <laughs> the jugular <laughs> of the ego. You know, it's like anything else. When you start learn how to ride a bike, like we saw in As It Is In Heaven, you, you gain some, some confidence. <laughs> balancing and pedaling before you go enter, you know, a triathlon or something, or, you know, a train. So, what I'll start off with uh, at the beginning here is, I'm going to start off with the Serenity Prayer. It's, because some people say, well, the Course is 1,200 some pages, can't you summarize the Course in a little more succinct way than other than 1,200 pages of words? I say, well, yeah, the Course is just a version of the Serenity Prayer. You know, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, you know, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So that's really what the Course is about, except to do that, to make that change, to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. It, it really takes a lot of mind training and discernment. That's why it's the 365 lessons in the Course and over 600 pages of text in the text to help prepare your mind, and then even the teacher's manual. So what we're going to do today is, um, I'll just briefly go over this, and then what we can do is, we'll go through it in an experiential way, so you can actually either use your instrument for peace and write in the uh, the things that come to mind for you, for, that you're wanting to work through. You can do it on a piece of paper that you have, if you want to keep this, and you want to take it home and Xerox it, uh, to practice it. You might want to keep the one that, with the blank, and just write your answers in here, on the paper. It's also, like Chris said, it's on the website, so if anybody wants to just go and you have internet access, you could just go to our website and go to the library and just download it. And, uh, 
print it out from there. So what it does, I'll just read the introduction. Instruments for Peace, Working Through Upsets and Healing Your Mind. The mind at peace is healed. The mind at peace has wholeheartedly welcomed peace. In this world, lack of peace appears in many forms. For permanent healing to occur, lack of peace must be traced back to its singular cause in the mind. Use of this instrument for that tracing back can help a willing mind let go of what it thinks it knows, see the world differently, and experience a present state of peace and joy. So that's the introduction. It's just a very little practical tool to keep the focus on the peace. We're doing this for the peace of mind. So we'll start with number one, and you can see it's, you can just uh, answer the question and fill in the blanks or put it down on your paper as honestly as you can, but if you have something that's troubling you or upsetting you, uh, it doesn't really matter what it is, and it doesn't matter how strong it is or intense, if there's anything that's disturbing you in any way, something that's been rolling through your mind, um, Bill and I just were meeting in his bus about half an hour ago, and Bill was saying, I have an unsettling kind of feeling. And then there's thoughts probably that go with that. The unsettling, that would be the, the feeling. It feels a little unsettled. And then you would kind of use this to kind of get in touch with what's going on under that unsettled feeling and as a way of releasing that to come to peace. So you start off with, uh, with what you're thinking about. Um, it can be just thoughts or it can be thoughts about specific persons, places, events, thoughts about what is coming next in your life. Um, or thoughts about something that just happened fairly recently in your life, maybe even during this uh, retreat, you know, that was a little unsettling or something, but something that seems to kind of bu be bubbling up in your consciousness and that you would like to, to use this instrument to work through. So that's what we mean by it's very practical. So you just start off with and take a little time and if there's anything in your awareness that you feel any bit of upset with, any bit of lack of peace with, then just start off with number one and fill in A with, when I think about A, which can be a past or future action, situation, or event. Um, it, or it could even involve person. Um, just feel free to write anything that comes to mind in there for A. And then you can see where B is, will follow right after that. In B, you just really are trying to name the specific upsetting emotion. Uh, it could be like when we did the, the little workshop on on the cloud and the heart, you know, where you may have even several specific emotions that come, or maybe it's just one one that comes to mind that you want to that kind of focalize you want to work with. And then as soon as you've got your your action or situation, event, person, and your feelings that are associated with that action, event, situation, or person, then C, well, you would try to name who or what seems to be to blame, or uh, there's a second part, the second line there in C, uh, or what you're afraid will occur in the future. Just filling in the specifics of what you're afraid will occur in the future, or of who or what seems to be the blame. This could even include blaming yourself. 
Mm-hmm. In many cases, people, you know, feel like there's nobody to blame in their life, but they blame themselves for mm. for the feelings, and so that you can certainly fill your put your own name in there. Mm. Yeah, you could fill in both of them if you if you have someone to blame, and you still have these um, ideas of what could happen in the future that is part of the worry or the concern or the anxiety. Okay, now, number one is about complete then, once you've kind of been able to articulate all of that, bring it out and write down. Then, number two, what we're going to work at is going a little deeper. You might almost think of D for deeper because it takes it a little deeper into your mind than what you're perceiving and thinking, what you're feeling, and and the justifications or reasons that you're telling yourself. That's all encapsulated in number one. Number two is stating A, B, and C. You know, the the actions, situation, events, persons, all the feelings associated with those actions, events, situations, and persons, and and also the justifications of, of why, who's to blame, or or the recurrent thoughts about the future that are troubling, all of those prove that I am right about D. And D is basically what we have been calling in our workshop, our retreat, the self-concept. Everything you think and feel and and believe about yourself that's related to the images of the world. Not only your personality self, which seems to be who you are, the persona or the mask, but everything that's part of the mask, the environment that seems to surround the person, is also part of that mask. So it's not just like, uh, I know like, you know, the indigenous people, the Maori, they have this, maybe put on the paint and the mask, it's not just like wearing a Halloween mask, it's also including the entire environment that you perceive yourself as in. So you might say that that's part of the ego's disguise. It's not only made up a false body identity, but it wrapped the identity in a cover or a shell, which is the world. And so it's not only about having to release your personality, but it's having to release what you think you know about the shell, too. For instance, uh, like things like gravity, you know, that's something you learn in science, you know, well, there's gravity and centrifugal force and so on and so forth. That's all made up. That's all part of the self-concept, too. We didn't get to watch it yet, but we have a, a movie called The Truman Show, where the whole world seems to revolve around Truman. And at one point, when Truman goes missing, it's dark, it's night, and so Kristoff, which is like the ego figure in the movie, says, um, Cue the sun. In other words, they have to let the sun rise. They can even tell when the sun's coming up. And and the sun is even part of this artificial environment for Truman. And you might say that things that are, even in this world, that are accepted as natural, you know, the dawn and the dusk, and the sun rising and falling, and the moon rising and falling, that seem to be part of such a deep cycle of human history, that people call them, those those are natural phases, they would say. That's the natural movement of the planets and the stars. Nothing is natural. <laughs> this, this entire cosmos is artificial. So even what is talked of as the natural environment, like what we're surrounded in, versus the man-made or the built environment, sometimes people make the distinction. No, it's all part of this self-concept. So, uh, you can just write D out in any way that you feel comfortable. You could, you can call it uh, my self-concept, my self-image, uh, the self I made up to take the place of God, uh, the self that God created, um, the role that I play, the role that I play, the mask that I wear. You know, any words that are comfortable for you about uh, the me that I think I am. Yeah, the me that I think I am. Anything that feels comfortable about that uh, thing. And I think the key word in there is A, B, and C prove that I am right 
about 